Well, all right, let's go ahead. Okay. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I am, uh, thank you for coming out. I am uh, excited to introduce our next speaker, Reed, uh, this week's speaker, Reed Stevens. Reed's a, a good friend and colleague, um, someone I've known. We haven't really actually worked directly together, but I'm an uh, advisor to one of his grants currently, but um, known for a really long time. So Reed, um, when I think of Reed's work, I think of someone who's really looking, as a career, has been looking at um, thinking, learning, cognition in complex environments, including workplace environments, school, some that are designed, some that aren't designed. Um, for those of you who do not do work related to learning technologies, there's been, oh, I don't know, over the past, I don't want to probably using part of his intro, but, but, but there are, um, there's always been an interest in trying to, trying to use education to do more, to, to, to help people think in particular ways. And something I love about Reed's work is Reed more than about anyone I know has really carefully looked at cognition in professional settings, in places where people are using technology and, and doing complex problem solving, and then trying to very seriously engineer the kinds of learning experiences um, um, or the kinds of thinking environments where you do that sort of complex work and where learning can take place in this sort of rich, complex um, way. Um, Reed's current work, which I'm sure he'll be talking about at least some today, um, is on the FUSE project, which is, I will just say as, as a relatively unbiased person, is, is I think the most sophisticated, best enacted, uh, modern, complex learning environment that I've seen, um, better than anything I had done, I was going to say. Um, so he's, he's got more of their best work. Um, and in particular, the way that they are thinking about scaling and growing, so how do you get this beyond just something I'm doing in a research lab, but something that's going to potentially change uh, learning experiences and lives for many, many, many more people is also, um, I think, the most sophisticated I've seen. And then one last thing I'll say that I've told him before is that I think in many ways something I really like about it is it builds a lot from a lot of the work that all of us have been doing in this domain and synthesizes it and puts it together in a really creative, uh, exceptional way. So. I think I'll also, oh, oh uh, Reed is a professor at Northwestern um, in, in uh, learning sciences, edu education and social policy, is that your school's name? That's the school. That's the yeah. school's name. Um, was at Washington before that, where he was a lead on the Life Center, which was um, the uh, largest, I think, attempt at trying to understand learning, thinking, cognition in schools, out of schools, from the brain all the way to the social level. So he has a whole different chapter of his career that was uh, leading much of that effort. So thank you. Well, Kurt, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, very generous comments about Fuse, and hopefully you'll see some of that in, in my talk today. So um, I'm going to talk about the Fuse learning environment. Um, um, but before I do that, I'm going to say a little bit about the research that I do. And what I'm going to try to do is tell you about the research that I do. Um, and as Kurt said, how I took some lessons from that research in particular, something that a lot of people here are interested in, and I've been influenced by that work, by the work that Kurt and Constance and Katie have done and Mimi, um, looking at the affordances of gameplay and game communities and how I leverage that into, and I think Kurt used a good word, sort of synthesized insights from that into this new environment. So um, the basic uh, nature of the work that I do is I, I do field studies. Um, I do ethnographic work and I use video recordings heavily in analyzing those settings and um, broadly I look at issues of learning and knowledge and use both in and out of school and it's mostly in STEAM areas. Everyone here probably knows that acronym Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, Math. Um, and I'm typically using a conceptual frame that again I think in this community is probably familiar. I'm looking at socio-technical systems of humans and non-humans um, in those in those contexts. A little bit more about the research. Um, I think as I got ready for this, I tried to say what are sort of two defining features of how I approach um, the context that I select for research. One is that I, I actually, I want the work that I do to be meaningful, um, not just to a small disciplinary community, but to speak a little bit more broadly. Um, so I often pick context where there's some kind of controversy um, about a learning or knowledge related issue. Um, two examples I'll say in a minute. And then in turn, um, there aren't many or there are no kind of ethnographic field studies that inform those controversies. Um, and the study that I'll talk about a little bit of video game play was an example of that. Um, so two studies, um, two lines of work that I've done that sort of fit into these, that meet these two criteria is um, 
I've done a fair amount of work and I'm continuing to do this work. Um, we've all heard the sort of calls for more techno-scientific skills for future workers, for the economy. Um, there, there wasn't, and this goes back to my dissertation, which was 20 years ago now, there, there was not a lot of research that actually looked at what, when, and Kurt talked a little bit about this, about what is it exactly that techno-scientific professionals do. So I just went out and took a look. Um, and in some cases, for example, paid attention to the question of math. Math, you, you often will hear, we need more math, we need more math. Well, what, what is the math? What are the mathematical tools and ideas that people use? And so we've looked at that. And when you look at it from a distributed perspective, um, when so much of computation is pushed to machines, what really do people need to do and what do they need to learn? So that's one kind of question. And then another one that you'll see a little bit in the context of this video game study, now more than a decade old, um, is I'm, I'm just basically interested in what kids learn with everyday technologies that are familiar. And video games are one of those contexts we've studied. Mobile devices, I've still engaged in a study with some colleagues at the University of Washington around that. So those are some um, aspects of my approach. And now I'm going to share one more aspect that comes from a sociologist of education and social organization, Howard Becker. And I stumbled upon this early in my career. Um, um, was handed it really. Someone said, you know, you should read this paper, and uh, the paper is provocatively called "A School's a Lousy Place to Learn Anything." Um, and Becker lays out a, a logic of inquiry right at the beginning of the paper that I that has really guided me through a lot of my work. So I'm going to add that to the story. So I'll just read a few short paragraphs from the beginning of the paper. So what Becker starts the paper is saying, he says, institutions create myths to explain to their participants what they do, how they do it why society needs it done, typo, and how successful they are. Every institution fails in some measure to do the job it promises, and its functionaries find it necessary to explain both that they're trying to do better and that the disparity between promise and performance does not exist, is not serious, or occurs only rarely. So here comes the logic of inquiry. There's sort of two points that Becker makes. First, institutional apology as meaning explanations divert our attention from the very the way the very organization of an institution produces its failures. So he's arguing that it's sort of built into ways that institutions are structured, that the failures are outcomes. I haven't as much used that part of the logic, but this part I've used quite heavily. Um, Becker goes on to say, further, they, these institutional apology ideas, divert us from comparisons, which might show how others, meaning other institutions, other contexts, under a different name and rhetoric, actually perform the institution's characteristic function more effectively. So if school is a lousy place to learn anything, we all obviously learn a lot. So where are those contexts where learning is organized successfully, productively? And my answer has been, um, and Kurt referenced this uh, multi-year um, endeavor, I was part of the leadership of a, of a life center. This is a diagram on the screen that I created for that center more as a conversation starter. At the time, we were funded by the National Science Foundation. And up until that point, and the National Science Foundation funds a lot of research around education and learning and workforce development and all those sorts of things. Most of their research funding at the time had gone to, to funding in-school studies, particularly in math and science. So what this diagram depicts is if you calculate the time that students and people over a lifespan spend in just the academic subjects, not in homework, not in recess, not on vacation. These are the numbers. And look how small the numbers are that people actually spend in those contexts. And that's where the bulk of the money was going. So part of our argument for the Life Center and part of the argument for the work that I do is I think we ought to be massively diversifying the context we look at. And I had lunch with Kurt and a couple um, of the students, and I was really happy to hear that people here are looking at a really wide range of contexts and trying to understand what's going on, and I really support that. So in answer to Becker's question, what I call this other part of the diagram, the sea of blue, that's where I think we ought to be looking. So um, to go on, um, last bit about my research, um, imposing upon that diagram another percentage, um, in that range when you're sort of in your schooling years, there's something that happens that people are doing almost 50% of their waking hours. Anyone want to guess what that is? 
back there, the gentleman. Uh, that's only about seven and a half percent, but you're on the right track. Media and screens. So um, this survey um, by the Kaiser Foundation established that almost 50% of kids' time in that age is spent on screens, and this was a number of years ago. So by my argument and Becker's argument, we ought to be looking there as much or more as we're looking at school because that is a cultural curriculum, right? And so that will lead me now to talk a little bit, um, oh, and then this final slide was just to say um, this imposes eight of what have been about 20 field sites that I've been in over 25 years. Um, and I, I think I learn more about learning and social organization each time I look at a new setting that's different. And that's why I'm sort of unusual in looking at young kids, older people, different contexts. I've looked at museums, I've looked at schools, and I'm trying to look at common questions across those, those different contexts. So here is sort of an encapsulation of what I see as my sort of program of work that connects um, the kind of basic field studies that I just described and I'm going to exemplify in a minute with um, an example of this game study, is that I conduct field studies in what would be called informal environments out in that sea of blue. And what I try to do is identify the sort of productive, both interactional and organizational features of those settings. And that's sort of the basic research that I do. Um, Kurt described it well. But then, especially with this project that I'll describe in a minute, which is called Fuse or Fuse Studios, is I've tried to take what I learned and not just put it out there in a paper or an article, but to feed it back into the design of something and try to make, the, make a go of that. And so most of what I'll talk about today is that. Then the other steps in the project is once you've sort of used what you've learned in the field for a design, we put it in play in a kind of research practice partnership model. I don't know how familiar that terminology is around here. Um, and then, again, go back and do more ethnographic field studies of this new thing you've put in play and tune and tweak and improve over time. And the, the few study that I'll talk about in a few minutes, we've been at since the pilot um, in 2011, and here we are in 2019. So, um, but with regard to this first step, phase one, I'm going to talk about a study um, that intersects with interest here in the informatics department, in particular the group of people I mentioned earlier who have paid attention to video game play. Um, the video game study we did now more than 10 years ago, um, a paper published there by, um, thankfully, um, Katie Salen put together a great volume, and the, uh, one of the papers that's sort of become well known of from that project was published in that mm -hmm. volume. Uh, what we did was we wanted just to understand what kids were learning and how as they played the video games they were normally choosing to play in their homes. So what we did is we recorded and talked to tweens and teens playing those games. We videotaped the interactions of them playing, and we set up an unusual s situation which um, there had been some studies of gameplay prior to that, but what they had almost always been was just what's over on the left side. They had been what is going on in game. For an ethnographer, you need what's going on in the room too, between people, between people and materials. So what we did is we figured out a way to synchronize recordings coming both out of what was in the room and what was on the screen, and that became our data set. So we could look closely at how what people did in the room affected what happened in the game and how people responded to what was going on in the screen um, in the room. So why did we do that study? And this goes back to some of the logic I described earlier. First, games and play are primary interests for children and young people. Second, games at the time and still are a source of major controversy in adult society. And finally, gaming, at least at the time, was understudied ethnographically in 2005. So putting those three things together made it a good thing to go and do um, for my work. So now what I'm going to do is talk about just one of the findings of that study, but one that's particularly central to what we made use of for Fuse. So one of the things, um, for those of you who know some of the games literature, going back to someone that Kurt and Constance worked with, Jim G, he made an argument in a book that's pretty well known 
about what games, um, video games, have to teach us about learning and literacy. And he made the point that video games are structured in a way to make learning more effective in a way than other kinds of contexts. So he was talking about the, the medium and the material of the game, and no dispute with that point. However, when we went and looked at this issue ethnographically, we found something else, which was what is, what is represented there as the study finding. And we coined this phrase of learning arrangements. And what we found was that young people, when they're trying to get better at games, they either invent or organize what we call learning arrangements, diverse and productive learning arrangements, meaning kids learn from each other in these contexts. Now, as I was talking to some folks at lunch, you, when you think about teaching, you usually think, oh, someone is a professional teacher. None of these kids obviously went to professional video game teacher education school, right? <laughs> so they were drawing on these resources from something that just came out of their everyday life. So let me give you four examples um, of that. And they're just four of dozens of examples we found in this study. Um, in, the, in the first frame there, uh, a girl, Rachel, is an older sister to a brother. He's a bit more of a gamer. She wants maximum control of her game. So as she's playing, she used him as a just-in-time resource. So he'd be off in the other part of the room doing his homework. When she needed something, being the older sister, she could say, get in here. And he would come, deliver it, and then she'd say, get out of here. So that was her way and their way together of organizing that learning arrangement. Um, a sort of flip version of that in the lower frame, uh, Brandon, again, a younger sibling, was a bit more experienced gamer and he played a lot more. His sister was interested in games, and so she would sit behind him in the room, and, and in this particular picture, you can't see it's small, but she's got a kind of a game guide, and she'll just be throwing stuff out at him, sort of constantly over his gameplay, and as we analyzed it, a lot of it he ignored, but once in a while she'd like hit on something and it would become kind of an ambient resource in the room and he'd make use of it and it would propel his gameplay. A um, couple other examples that I particularly like, uh, these two boys in the upper left here are friends and one of the boys on the left in the green, one of the things he did when he was, was they're playing a platformer game and you know as you know those games have sort of lots of complicated button pushing moves that you have to do to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So what did this kid do? He took a non-used controller and he wanted to help his friend see, but he, if, you sh if you try to show him on this, you're not looking at the screen, right? So he took an unused controller and walked into his line of sight and tr did the moves so he could let his friend both in the same line of vision see the moves and what they were are meant to accomplish, and that eventually taught his friend. And the final example that I like, if you know Laven Wenger's notion of legitimate peripheral participation, this was kind of a physical instantiation of it. So you had two older brothers playing a game and a younger sister who was, because she was the younger sister, hanging around with them and wanting to play too. They would play a game together, and as games do, they level up. And what would happen is they get to kind of a boring part of the game when they're just kind of making motions through the game and they're not up to the boss and it's sort of easy. So what they would do is once they got past the challenging bits, they would pause the game and they would literally bring her in from the periphery and they would hand her the controller and let her play the game at this level for a while. Then they'd reach the boss, they'd pause again and back to the periphery they'd, have, they'd send her and they did this successively level after level. For, for them, they were kind of avoiding the boring parts, but she was into it because she was... Now, there's a lot to say about these different examples, but all of them were effective learning arrangements that were sort of discovered or invented by these kids. So the way we took it um, when we wrote about it was to say, when kids want to be good at something, they have a lot of resources that we haven't tapped for them to learn and teach together as peers in this case. So that's going to lead me on to tell you a little bit about how we have made use of these ideas in the design of a learning environment called Fuse. Um, so um, so what questions is Fuse trying to solve? Um, one is, and you can, if you were to read into the literature in education, 
education as we know it that many of us experienced um, is entrenched and is very hard to change. Um, I have kids, uh, I've talked to colleagues here including Kurt and Mimi um, just today. School tends to be the same. We sit in situations like this, there's a teacher at the front of the room, she or he instructs, we practice at things, we take tests, we have grades that accumulate, and that's how that thing goes over and over and over again. College often isn't very different. There have been critiques about that, and I'll show you an old one in a minute, for a long time. But it's, it's proven very durable and resistant to change. So one of the things we are trying to do is to ask the question, could we get something different to happen in schools? And just to say, Fuse wasn't initially an in-school environment. We actually began it, um, and I was myself a pessimist. I didn't think this could fly in schools, so we actually started as an out-of-school thing. It was in community centers, and it still lives in some of those places. But it's been surprising that it's been mostly successful in schools, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, what I think of as nearly as big a problem that Fuse is addressing is trying to reimagine STEAM or, and I've, I've done that funny parentheses thing because honestly, Fuse is really about technology, engineering, and arts. It's not as much about what we typically think of science and math, so I'm sort of shearing off the S and the M, you know, probably good for other reasons, you know. Um, <laughs> but that it's really, it's focused on those three kinds of areas. And we all know there are issues right now um, with equity, and I'm going to talk specifically about that issue in a minute, um, but we've tried to make this an environment that's friendly, welcoming, and successful for all kids. Um, and you can, you can see what you think about how we've done. And then finally, um, one of the things that I did earlier in my career and continue to do, uh, a lot of my funding has come from the National Science Foundation, and a lot of what I characterize my prior work going back to my dissertation is studies of kind of project-based learning environments, funded by the National Science Foundation, often involving technology, arts, interdisciplinarity, all sorts of things like that. Um, these are images from two of my actual projects, um, 20 years old and 15 years old in those two frames. What happens typically, what happened to those, these two projects and what happens to a lot of projects that are innovative like this is that when the money goes away and the professors go away and the grad students go away, the project withers and leaves the school. So this is a bit of a goofy diagram to suggest what happens is that the sort of broader ecosystem of the school sort of swallows up the learning innovation. And in those two cases, and in many cases of colleagues I have, you know, an NSF has spent significant funds on these projects, millions of dollars. Within a year or two, they're gone. There's no trace of them left in the school, or it's minimal, or it's there because you have one fiercely strong teacher who's holding the line against everything else. So one of the things I really wanted to do with Fuse is see if we could actually create something that was sustainable, and that meant not doing certain kinds of things you often do in these projects. So for example, we don't pay teachers, and we don't have a very high touch support structure the way these projects often do, because we wanted to see and learn what happens when we give them the necessary support we think to begin and let them adapt it and grow it on their own. So now I'll, I'll tell you what Fuse is about, and that will be um, the rest of the talk. It's kind of in two parts because this is a design community. It was really valuable to me to tell you a little bit about how we approach the design. Um, and Kurt has said nice things about it in the past, and I think it's, uh, I appreciated him saying again. So wanted to sort of disclose how we've approached the design. I don't know if it's radically different from how other people approach design, but we'll see. And then well, most of what I'll talk about and towards the end is what I promised in the title. Is I'm gonna show you the kinds of experience students have in this environment that are significantly different than what we can usually, what we usually see in schools. So Fuse began as a pilot in 2011. I'm the founder and um, have been the PI of all the grants. Um, uh, but you'll see a bigger team of people who work on this later. Um, it's grown a lot. Um, we're now in over 160 schools in the US. Um, we are likely to add maybe 100 next year. Um, there's 75 that look like they're gonna be added by one 
organization we're partnering with. And on a weekly basis, kids, 24, more than 24,000 kids are doing Fuse one to three times a week. So a um, couple graphs. Um, I mentioned that when we started, it was an out-of-school thing. So if you look at this graph, this is a cumulative number of youth participants who've been in Fuse. We're right under 60,000 now. Um, first couple of years, there's none because we weren't in schools. And in 2013, that's when we sort of got into schools. And then here's the current in-school implementations. As I mentioned, we're, it's about 165 schools. That includes um, six in Helsinki, Finland, um, which is an interesting story in itself. Um, many people may know Finland is, we often treat it as like sort of the paragon of great education. So it's been a pretty interesting and rewarding experience to have them adopt FUSE because they've, they feel like it, it sort of advances their new kind of they have a, a broad curricular vision for the country. And this is one of the examples of something they thought fit well with what they're trying to do. Um, now I want to let you see what Fuse involves. You can see some pictures. You can see it, it involves making stuff. But I'm going to kind of take you through it a little more carefully. So here's a, a little map of the user experience that a kid would go through in Fuse. And then I'm going to show you a, a short video that we created. It's, it's both kind of a PR video and it's also an informative video. We did it with a documentary filmmaker who we sent out. And we had him go out and ask kids questions, ask teachers questions, ask the principals questions, and put it together uh, to tell our story a little bit. So that those two should introduce what Fuse is about. Um, so uh, like many things, it starts with logging on to a website. Um, the core aspect of what Fuse is about are things called challenges or challenge sequences. Um, we, you'll see in the video, we borrow the metaphor from video games directly that the challenges level up. Um, we borrowed a lot of ideas from game designers. So the first challenge um, in game design, you have to, you know, the, one of the mottos is you need people to have a success within the first five minutes so that they stick with it. So the first challenge is usually relatively easy, and then they get harder. And you unlock subsequent challenges by doing something that I'll explain in a second. So you pick a challenge. Um, here's a shot of the challenge gallery. Um, there are challenges there, um, solar roller, eye candy, and they've got all these sort of kid-friendly names. We built these because, because we know things about what kinds of things kids are interested in. And then if you notice on that challenge gallery, all of them have a play button. Um, we take the idea of getting kids interested very seriously. It's not here's the curriculum, here's what you're going to do. So those are trailers. And so every video has its, its own trailer. So here is one of those trailers. watch that, does that entice them like a video game to try that challenge? And if they say yes, they try the first level. And the levels come with all kinds of support materials we've designed, so sort of basic instructions. It comes with on-demand help that we've built into the system, um, diagrams, a lot of videos, because we know kids use videos, particularly videos. Um, when you complete the challenge, what do you do? It, this is, again, analogous to gameplay. Uh, you upload your successful challenge to the website and thereby unlock the next challenge. So you upload it, and so here's an example, following on the example of Solar Roller. Here's an example of a kid who's, this is their documentation video that unlocks the next level after they've managed to get it through the tunnel without any light. So they've used a capacity. So they do that and then they can level up so they can go to the next level. That's one path, that's not the only path. 
and the fundamental thing that Fuse is about is choice. So as hard as it is to believe in school, we give kids full and total choice over their experience inside Fuse. Um, they, we may ask teachers to persuade them to continue <coughs> with their work, but if they decide they've just done level one of solar role, they don't want to continue, they don't have to. If they work with other kids on the first level and they want to work alone, they do that. So another pathway kids might take is, ah, solar roller is kind of fun, but I want to go try something else. And then sometimes, which I'll get into a little bit at the end of the talk, is they might get interested in something and pursue a related idea and extend what's in the challenges, but not do what's in the challenges. In the typical language of schooling, that would be being off task. But we've decided a number of years ago, because of things we saw among kids, to call that off-road. And you know, off-road has its advantages. You're exploring things that haven't been laid out for other people, but you discover things. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. So here's the video that gives you kind of an overview and gives you a first sense, again, a, a, an edited sense by someone who was trying to help tell our story, but you'll see some research videos in a minute um, of kids' experiences. But this gives a, a pretty decent overview of what Fuse is about. I never heard of anything like this before. And I was like, oh my gosh, we really get to do this? It was really fun. Nothing's impossible in Fuse. Fuse is a new approach to learning developed by researchers and educators at Northwestern University that allows students to follow their interests and tackle STEAM challenges at their own pace. And yes, they <laughs> have fun doing it. My favorite thing is to be in the Fuse lab even before the class comes in, because as they come in, the buzz starts. Here's how it works. Students choose. The students have all of these challenges to choose from. They get to then pick what interests them the most, what types of problems they're most concerned with, and then learn at their own pace, at their own rate, and learn something that truly interests them. The fact that you get to choose what you do, you get to learn by yourself when you're not just learning out of a book. It's more of an open environment. There are dozens of challenges available. My favorite challenge is Dream Home Gut Rehab. TJ Customizer. The 3D Laser Defender. Selfie Sticker. Get in the game for the ball. And these challenges are actually tough, I'm not gonna lie. Fuse builds important 21st century skills, such as creativity, adaptive problem solving, and the willingness to fail but persist. In Fuse, failure is just another try. In Fuse, there is no right or wrong. It's just, if you fail, pick yourself back up and just continue. If there's something you want to do, go for it. And if it doesn't work out, oh well, tweak something and try again. Fuse engages and motivates students using the idea of leveling up, just like in video games. The kids get the video game model. They work with it and they like it. It all jives right with where they're at. Once students get engaged, challenges level up, getting harder, requiring them to build on knowledge and skills from previous levels. It starts them off really slow with a very simple level one challenge where they have to do something kind of basic, where they learn how to use the software, and then it gradually increases to make it more intricate in terms of design and process. As you might imagine, a few studio requires a different approach to teaching. It's more about facilitating, asking questions, helping students think and do for themselves. Unlike a uh, traditional classroom where usually the teacher is the, the instructor giving out all the information, in Fuse, I kind of just guide them through the process of design thinking and through the challenges. My relationship with students has changed as a result of Fuse. I have learned just as much from the kids as they learn from me. A unique thing about Fuse is the culture that develops in the classroom. Because each student works on challenges in a different order, they develop unique expertise that they want to share with others. They help each other and truly learn from each other. There are absolutely students who emerge as leaders. Some are leaders in problem solving. Some are leaders in being cheerleaders for other students. Others are leaders when they aren't leaders in other subjects or socially, and they get to be the person people come to when they need help or advice. I see these students becoming leaders, becoming instructors, turning around and helping other kids, regardless of their age level, their functional level, taking ownership of whatever challenge they find engaging and helping others through it. That's what I see every single time I run that studio. This is where students who never thought of themselves as good at engineering, science, or programming find a fascination that can be life-changing. I've never really seen myself in like a future in math or science, but as I'm infused, it's like I'm starting to 3D print or I'm building my dream home, and it's like I could actually do this. It's not 
boring. It's something that's actually fun. In the fuse class, I realized that I'm more intelligent than I've actually given myself credit for. I learned that I, I love technology. Now, because of fuse, I actually feel like being um, an astronomer. An engineer, an astronaut, an architect. This is where your future begins. You're not really teaching kids some specific, narrow piece of content that exists in isolation. There. You're teaching them how to learn, how to investigate, how to cope with failure, how to manage success and dovetail that into your next project. These are skills that will serve them well, no matter what job, what field, what sort of life experiences they have. It's amazing to see what the kids can do. And I'm surprised every day when we're in there. And they just, the students love going to Fuse every day. So that's obviously a PR video, but I'm gonna show you now that the research we've done, um, funded by the National Science Foundation, really backs up the ideas that are captured there. One question you might be asking yourself is, how new are the ideas that sort of animate this? And I thought I'd read a quote um, to give some sense of that. Um, this particular scholar had this to say, none of the things that are to learn should ever be made a burden to them, burthen, strange phrase, or imposed <laughs> upon them as a task. Whatever is so proposed pres presently becomes irksome. The mind takes an aversion to it. So it is with children. A child will learn three times as much when he is in tune, as he will double the time in pains when he goes awkwardly or is dragged unwillingly to it. So that um, comes from the contemporary educational scholar John Locke, who said that in 1693. Um, you can read a lot of John Dewey, and you can see the ideas that we're implementing here as present in Dewey. So I don't think the ideas of using interest and kids' agency is new. I think we've put the pieces together in a way that works. And that's really what I think the achievement of Hughes is. Um, but Locke was an influential character, and uh, schools stayed the way they did for 300 plus years. So the, the hard thing is to see if we can build a different way of doing it that actually is sustainable. Um, so now I'll, I'll get a little bit more into the, um, the aspects of Fuse, but I wanted to be articulate about how we took things from our game study and from work that other people who study in formal learning, including Mimi and Kurt and Constance, have done, and how we sort of synthesized what we learned about these other kinds of environments, adapted them, and brought them into school in a workable, sustainable way. So we, as I just said, we drew on various productive features of informal learning. Um, we modeled the core challenge idea on video games and how they level up. Uh, we provided what we think of as curated choice so that choose, students can choose and navigate through those choices on their own. Um, we think we've created an environment that is incentivizing rather than disincentivizing for being creative, for taking risks, and quote, failing. And when failure doesn't land on you reputationally or in terms of your grades, and you can do what you do when you don't succeed in a level and give it another go, um, it, it's a very different mechanic. Um, and what we were really seeking to do, and I think this is the biggest achievement that we, we've achieved, and hopefully this will play out as in the data analysis I show you in the next bit, we really have created a peer culture that's similar to kind of family and friend-based friend gaming, even though this isn't a game, right? It's a different kind of animal. And I think broadly, and I'll return to this point in the conclusion, I think what, we've, what we did and what I learned from that prior study and other people's studies is that we've recognized that young people have significantly greater resources for learning from each other, for being drivers of their own learning, and persisting in the face of challenge and quote failure than is typically leveraged and supported in classrooms. So if we really believe that, how would we design environments? Um, and I think this is, this is just one example. So now I'll get a little bit more into the technical details about the design. Um, we have a very modular design approach. Uh, these are components, these challenges and challenge levels within them, challenge sequences and challenge levels, and we tinker with them quite a bit. And I'm going to give you a case study of how we tinker with them. Um, there's a lot of advantages to this approach. You don't have to deliver one whole curriculum en masse, and you can be adaptive to new things kids are interested in, new pieces of software that, you know, 3D printers that didn't exist before and now exist. and so. There's, and then, as I'm about to show you, 
you can work with partners who have expertise in these areas and slot in challenges that line up with both kids' interests and what is going on and new in the world. So uh, here's sort of some of the data stuff. Uh, we have, uh, we've built this thing that allows us grade out there are the names of some of the schools and districts they're in. We have all of our um, hundreds of schools in this database and you see in the columns are green and gray, uh, the starts and complete rates of those schools and uh, the team completes. You can either work as a team or an individual and we track that data. Um, this is a slightly easier way to look at that. That's a sort of visualization that we create that's built on top of that. And the way you read this, of course, along the bottom, that's, that's time slices. Um, the, the colors represent different challenges. And if you read left to right, you can sort of see how popular at any particular time a challenge is. So one of the things we use these kinds of data for is to notice whether a challenge suddenly gets very popular or gets less popular. And we have a lot of data points. And so that's a resource for us to redesign things and go back in. So I'm going to give you an example of that, but I wanted to say a little bit about this other aspect of our design process that's been successful. When you saw the solar roller challenge, you might have seen the name of the company Siemens on there. We designed that challenge with them. They're trying to do a lot of sort of green energy things. Um, this is a challenge that we've recently finished. We have a partnership with Boeing. We have partnerships with a number of companies. We have a, a, a partnership that is starting with Apple around their everyone can create uh, materials. Um, and we effectively take other people's ideas in their profession and challengeize them. And that works for them because then they get to communicate in a way through these challenges with kids out in schools and it's a fair number of kids. So this is one example of that. This is a challenge we just finished up and is now live for kids in schools. It's called Design to Fly, and it's to design and build a custom flight controller and use it to fly a plane in a flight simulator. <coughs> this is a flight simulator that's already available on the computer. Typically, you run it by you know moving the keys, right, on the keyboard. Um, through the tools that we've provided, what we have is created a challenge with three levels. And the first level involves just making a left-right control that can be held. And that then you can fly the plane using those controllers. The second level involves mounting more controls to create an ideal layout. So here you're really doing kind of an HCI kind of thing. Um, and then the last one is sort of full control of all the elements of the plane as much as you can and really using graphic design and other things to create a fully usable interface. Um, kids right now love this and they're really liking it and Boeing really likes it um, because this, in their understanding, is a lot of the things they want their engineers to do. So they, they like that we're exposing young kids and um, I haven't said a lot about the age range of the kids who do Fuse. The, the sweet spot for Fuse is fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, but we do it with high school kids and strangely enough, the Finns are doing it with their third and fourth graders, and they're having them taught by their fifth and sixth graders. And so they're in a second language, so that maybe they are a little more advanced than us. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about that kind of iterative process of design um, around the question that is important, which is sort of, we know that technology, um, I think it's probably reflected in this program, there are gender imbalances in, in kind of technology-centered things. And so we've tried to really pay attention to that in the work we do. Um, this is an analysis, and I, I put a date on it because this changes over time. This is an analysis we did in 2016 because we wanted to ask the question, how many of the challenges are effectively gender neutral in terms of preference, meaning starts by kids? How many of them are preferred by boys? And how many are preferred by girls? We don't want boys and girls necessarily to like all the same things nor any other ways to divide up people, but we want it to be equitable in the number of things that appeal to them. And as of this analysis, it was pretty equal. So we had a number of gender neutral challenges and seven that boys preferred and seven that girls preferred. But um, notice um, <coughs> one of the challenges that the boys preferred was one called Robot Obstacle Course. And what that involved was taking the Lego Mindstorm robot, first building it, 
and then having it do a series of challenges that were like an obstacle course, going around things, going over things. So you could see why that might seem a little more boy appealing than girl appealing. This was our only robotics challenge. And so we thought we should be doing better in appealing, because if it's the only robotics challenge we have, can we reframe it and still keep the same kind of goals and do a better job appealing to girls? So we did redesign. And uh, on the prior side, you might have seen, um, I think a lot of people in this community are aware of the CSCW um, community. There's a kind of parallel version in learning called CSCL. They have a conference coming up in Lyon, France in June. And my postdoc and I have a paper about these issues of um, sort of equitable participation in as fused as a case. Uh, we redesigned this challenge. And what we did was we first, well, there, I don't know what came first, but what we did is we changed some things. First of all, we didn't make you have to build the robot. We used a pre-built robot. That's the one on the right. The one on the right is called Sparky. And notice that Sparky has a different kind of look and feel than the other one. It looks more like a, a friendly pet, right? We also changed the narrative frame on the challenge. And effectively, we're not changing anything about the kind of basic learning goals of the challenges, meaning we were still asking the students to program robots to do things to go there, come back, bring something, grab something, all that. But we changed it to how to train your robot. So now it was about you know, like how to train your dragon. We're always trying to play off the like, kind of cultural language that kids have. And we built challenges that align with this imagery. So like having your pet go fetch a ping pong ball and bring it back, that's the challenge now. So what happened was we had some success here. So the number of starts by girls increased by 12%. We're not at parity yet, 45 still isn't 50, but 45 is better than 33, right? And we had more girls completing level one, and one of the things we know about Fuse is if you complete a level, you're more likely to try the next level. If you complete a second level, you're more likely to try the next one. So getting kids to complete more of the level one challenges is a sort of a, a gateway to sort of increasing depth. But notice on the bottom, we didn't really have any negative effect. In fact, a positive, small net positive effect on the boys. So, and why is this? Because boys like pets just as much as girls do. So we were able to change the challenge, keep the core goals the same, and effectively improve the challenge. Um, so that's one bit of data. And then here's another bit of data um, about um, how we're doing with respect to sort of gender stuff. Um, the um, level completion rates are almost equivalent for boys and girls. And you'll notice that they're actually a little better for girls as they get to the higher levels, which means that at the higher levels, if girls have gotten to level four, if there's four or five levels in the challenge, they're gonna proceed slightly more often to complete the next level than the boys. So this is a pretty different kind of picture than you normally see about sort of tech heavy engineering heavy um, environments, okay? So that was meant to both tell you a little bit about our design process and, and show you about some of the concerns that we think about when we, we go about redesign. Some are more, more mundane. Um, a challenge doesn't seem very popular, it's not taking off. We go and look at the data and see, oh, maybe it's just the instructions aren't clear. Sometimes it's mundane and sometimes it's more conceptually substantive like this issue. So the remainder of the talk is me. I'm gonna tell you about the things that happen in Fuse for kids and let you hear from kids and let you see some examples of those kids. Um, a bit about the research methods we use. They're broadly ethnographic. We collect video in particular. This is an older version of something we've rigged up called the visor camera. It uses a visor that kids put on. It's got a GoPro-like camera that's sort of nestled under the top of the um, visor. Why do we need the visor camera? Here's an example of a few studios sped up. If you want to trace kids' experience in an environment like this where they're not stationary and seated and there's maybe 30 or 50 different islands of activity, you need to follow them as they move. And so this is the approach that we've taken. And those, those boxes you see, um, I use this diagram to make a different point. We've done an analysis of all of these different learning arrangements that are being formed in the course of a classroom. 
So now let me get to the core phenomena that we think are defining for Fuse and quite different than what happens in regular classrooms and regular subjects, especially STEAM-oriented classes. Um, diverse learning arrangements, relative expertise, learning from failure, interest development, and going off-road. So the first one was foreshadowed in the video game study. And what we found in this study of the Fuse classroom slash studios is that students, in a similar way, organize themselves into diverse and productive learning arrangements. Sometimes they do independent work. Sometimes they do joint work. Sometimes they engage in parallel collaboration, working on a challenge similarly and giving each other feedback. And sometimes they engage in things like you saw in that video game study, a sort of peer consultation that can be brief or can be enduring. Now let's hear from some of the kids. This is my student, Peter Meyerhoff, interviewing kids, asking them, he's, he asked them to tell them a story about something they've learned, and then he asked them how they learned it. So this will give you a sense of how kids think and talk about it. How did you figure out how to do that? Uh, Alex helped me a little, and... How did you figure out how to do that? Isabel told me. So how did you figure out how to do that? Um, well, someone helped me do it, but then after one time when they helped me, um, I was starting to do it by myself and helping other people do it. And I like helping other people um, with the printed printer so that they can print and they can have their prints and be happy with it. I, I did this. And you can show other people and you can help other people. And you're feeling like, wow, I'm like a pro. You feel like you're amazing. I used to suck at doing any computer technology. And now today, people are asking me right now, uh, can you help me with this? Can you help me? See, right now, right now. Yes, and that now, right now, people need my help right now, and it just makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel glad that I'm with you, and it makes me feel you know, like I that fuse can like I can change fuse, and fuse can change me. That's all. So, to make a point about how school, and this is an extreme point, I I grant, but how school <laughs> will sometimes handle our natural response to wanting to help each other and learn from each other. This is an actual picture of a testing situation in Singapore where the kids are taking the tests and they also have these blinders on. And that is an extreme case, but you don't typically feel in school that you can learn from other people. So a second point is this notion of relative expertise. And we find this developing in all the studios around a number of things. I'm going to give you a quick case in a minute. Relative expertise doesn't mean there are an expert for all of society, but within the room, they become an expert. And lots of interesting things. Mimi did some earlier work on kind of reputational stuff in games, and it really reminds me of that. We really have kids who develop a reputation, and you heard this in some of the teachers' comments in the video. Other kids start to come to kids who no one pays any attention to because they know things. And this is actually the case of this young woman, Carmen, who developed relative expertise in her classroom around 3D printing. Um, so most of the work I do is sort of qualitative cases, using video to develop that. And here's how we've kind of developed that case um, in a simple way. Carmen became interested in the 3D printer. She started hanging around it, just watching people's prints come out. Um, then she started helping the teacher with some aspects of it. And then he started providing some direct guidance, seeing her interest in it, right? Um, she started doing some of that alone, more independently. Um, then, when he was out on paternity leave, she kind of was the go-to person. She had to start helping others. And eventually, she became the 3D printer expert in the room. And this happens in almost every Fuse classroom that we have, is this kind of relative expertise around this or that or another thing develops. Um, and it has effects. Uh, here's her teacher facilitator saying, in class, she might not always show that confidence, here at Fuse, when it came to 3D printing, Carmen could tell you with confidence. She felt those effects, too. Here's her saying, I'm like the master of the printer now. And she goes on to make a really interesting analogy. She wants to be a cancer doctor for children. And she saw the anal analogy of fixing the 3D printer as similar to fixing the cancer kits. And so she's making connections between what she's doing here. It may be a pretty distal connection, but she's making that connection. 
Okay, so a third phenomena that we have routinely appearing in our classrooms is that FUSE does a pretty good job promoting persistence and productive failure. Um, this is Johanna, who um, we have a case of her overcoming frustration and learning from failure. So here's an example of some of the work she did. Um, this is a challenge called Dream Home. She builds her dream home in SketchUp. In the left frame, what you can see is her dream home. And you can see that the, the, the structure is actually lifted off the ground because she hadn't looked at it from all the perspectives and she accidentally built it in this impossible way, tilted up in the, in the space. Initially, she was super frustrated about that. But then she thought, I kind of like that. And she built from it. Um, again, not the kind of thing that normally happens in school. So she built, if you see in the frame two, there's now a structure beneath it. And then she accentuates it with the blue. And that triangular space under there now becomes a garage for her house. Um, here's what she had to say about it. Mid-year when she was struggling, she, my um, research associate asked her, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she spontaneously said, well, my mom wants me to be an architect but I don't want to. If I can't do this, meaning this challenge, then I can't be an architect. By the end of the year, after she got through that part and spent the rest of the year building out her dream home in this environment, she said, this kind of helped me decide that I wanted to be an architect after my mom said it, because it's fun to make your own things. So here's a clip of different kids talking about this this phenomena of sort of persisting and learning from failure. And it took us about like more than 20 times, but we kept um, going over it. 20 times? Yeah. Did you get frustrated? Yeah. How come you kept going? Because, well, it's kind of nice to see you accomplish it once you do, because you have some pleasure and with all the hard work you put into it. <laughs> You could enjoy solving the thing, solving the challenges in it, because it's not that hard and it's not that easy. So like, it helps us challenge ourselves to be better and think smarter. I kept going through trial and error, trying to create the kitchen I wanted and like the shape I wanted, and eventually I um, kept trying and trying and it actually worked. So that was. Um, a challenging time. What do you think you've learned in Fuse this year? Um, nothing's easy. It's everything you take steps and those steps are harder. To expect for things to be struggling and hard, but if you keep pushing yourself and get feedback from friends and teachers, you could do it and like it's a lot of fun, so you keep pushing yourself to do it. But like if you do something wrong, you like learn from it, you kind of do it better. So I feel like I don't want to be a quitter just because it's hard. I just want to like, keep trying and trying to like get it right. It's fun until you get to that one point where you meet, get a challenge that you do not understand, and then you get kind of aggravated. But then once you solve that problem, it feels good. It's it's fun, but it's challenging your mind. So it's like a brain teaser. It's a, like a fun challenge, and. It, um, teachers, I haven't talked a lot about teachers. There's a lot to say about teachers. I wanted to focus on the student experience. Um, here's an example of uh, a tweet from a teacher about a student. A highlight of my year, the student went from tears and frustration to programming this banner. This is a challenge called um, Mini Jumbotron. And here you see oh, the you kid finally getting it to work. And there it is working. So the fourth um, thing I've sort of foreshadowed a lot, this is diagram my colleague Kay Ramey put together to kind of conceptualize what we think happens, is kids bring prior interest into Fuse, they intersect with the challenges, and they take newly formed kind of bonded interests out into the world. And two examples I've already shown you is sort of Johanna, who brought in this interest ambivalently of architecture. She sort of felt like it came from her mom but it really solidified for her as she actually got to do some of this um, in her experience. And Carmen, who discovered and developed an interest in 3D printing, which she connected to a future. Um, another sense in which this is an interest developing thing, and I'm, stop, I'm ending on this one, because it's really, to me, 
in some ways the most important. Education isn't meant to be an end in itself. John Dewey said something like that. It's meant to put us in a situation to go further, go beyond, and grow. And so I mentioned this notion of off-roading earlier. Um, in school, if you're not doing what the class and the teacher tells you, we call it being off-task. What do you do with what happens when kids do the curriculum, the challenges, but then they want to do something else? In our case, we decided five years ago to embrace that because what we found is that kids were extending their work in ways exactly like we want ourselves to do when we learn something under someone else's guidance. So I'm going to give you three quick examples. Emil did the game designer challenge, did it three levels, but Emil got interested in making the graphics instead of just making the game. And so what happened is Emil went off and found a piece of software called Piskel, and he used Piskel to start designing, and you see, you saw some examples in the prior screen, extremely elaborate characters. And here in this quote, you can he see him saying that his goal now is to be a game designer, but not the person who designs the game mechanics, but the characters himself. And sort of this really became a sort of a, a goal-forming idea. Another example, one group did the same challenge game designer and then made a new game built on that game, they called Mario and Luigi, you can see where that comes from, and they made 25 levels and seven bosses over the rest of the year. And then they posted them to a game design site so other kids could play. And then here is a vivid example of off-roading a young woman did. That's the completed final level of uh, Dream Home that this girl did. So everything you see in the video that follows is an off-road extension that she did. So she added that, and she added that, she added that, she added that, and she added that. So all of that was not assigned by the curriculum, and we this is a routine phenomenon that we have happening in use. So those five things make up a pretty different set of outcomes and immersion experiences in Fuse that make it what we think is a different way to organize education in schools and has grown and become durable. I'm almost done. Um, I want to acknowledge the team of people who work on this with me and have worked on it over the years. It's this set of people. Um, and then uh, some concluding thoughts and then where I'll leave you with are some final words from the kids. because I think it's most important. I said this to Kurt um, earlier today when we were talking, and maybe also to Mimi. When I decided to make something, I wanted it to provide some joy and meaning to kids. I didn't want to bump math test scores up a little bit. I wanted it to be something like this. So here are two points that I think um, resonate for me from this experience. One is that young people are far more capable than our theories and established practices in school and elsewhere give them credit for. It was never them who were lacking, but the environments we built for them, so we can do better. And I believe, and this goes back to my understanding of how I want to relate research to design, I think there are vast untapped resources for inspiring new design ideas out in that sea of blue, where young people and adults are already being creative, engaged, and following their interests. So with that, I will finish with a final video of kids talking, and what we asked them here was open-ended. Um, there were two forms of the question. One was, um, just tell us what you think of Fuse. And then the other version that was sometimes asked is, if you could tell something to the designers, and we put it this way, bad or good, what would you say? So and here are the responses to that question. Learning in school is just like telling you. In time test, they stand and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And doing fuse, it's not like that. It doesn't really feel like you're doing math or science, so it's more fun than math or science. It's like a breath of fresh air, but you're still learning. I actually love fuse. It's like every Tuesday and Friday, I love coming here. It's like my friends, like they know how hyped I am to come here. Science, what's teaching about engineering. You go to Fuse, you do engineering, and it's like the same thing, just learning about it. And this is what science should be, honestly. Why have tests when you have, why have tests, why have grades, why have worksheets or textbooks when you have Fuse? Like,
Thank you so much for creating Fuse because I've learned so much of Fuse and I get to create things and have fun and this is just the best thing that I've ever had in school yeah. and learned. I've never seen anything like this. It's like... I would have never imagined this was possible. It's just, it, it's just, it's so amazing there's not a word to explain it. Like, I'm really thankful. I'm really thankful that Fuse was brought up because I wouldn't really be where I was without it. I would like to say that this was an amazing idea and thank you because this gives all kinds of kids a challenge to open their minds to new kinds of things. It's awesome. I just completely love Fuse. It's the best thing that has ever come to our school. Okay, so with that, thanks for listening. Time, we um, would people be open to going downstairs for refreshments for questions, or do you want to do a question or two mm -hmm. here? Maybe a few here, just okay. where it's quieter. I yeah, think. all right, let's do one or two here, and then okay. um, and then more respectful of time, so we'll go down. This gentleman and that woman. Thank you so much, because that was a really, really interesting talk. Um, I'm curious, like you started this talking about um, the, the learning outside of those learning institutions and environments and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, do you see much transfer into the ideas that they're learning um, or uh, the modes of learning that they're learning uh, in Fuse, outside, and then like beyond uh, in their school? Well, it's, it's an extremely good question. Um, Kurt mentioned this center that I was involved in earlier in my career, and those are the kinds of questions we tried to answer. You know, kind of practically, it's really hard to follow kids out of school into their homes. I've done it in the past. We tried to do it here. And it was hard. Um, so we were actually trying to mount a study right now where we do what anthropologists sometimes call revisits. And we're going to try to go back to some of these kids and just see what their memories and whether they have specific memories of challenges and just test whether it seems to have had some enduring effect. So the answer is we weren't super successful. That's the goal. We do have evidence, um, for example, Emil, the Piskel kid who I mentioned, he did um, his Piskel work in Fuse. Fuse in his school also was an after-school club. He would do it there, and he would do it at home. So we had, and we have some pretty good evidence that kids are extending the work and doing it elsewhere, but not strong research documentation, um, as, at least as, I, as much as I'd like. I think probably number one is a rule that anyone who parents or has played a parenting role knows, it's sort of encouraging to continue. Um, you don't want to just say, do it, but you want to persuade them to work their way through the challenges. The, that's probably number one, um, and it's a different, it's a different, it's a different role than when things are largely about compliance, right? Um, it's more of a persuasive role. And um, uh, some of the facilitators you saw in here are particularly good at that. A second thing is encouraging kids to find resources. You know, we're in the Google era. There's lots of information. As you guys know, in a school like this, there's lots of information out there. How do you go find it? So some of the teachers who do this particularly well have created kind of verbal routines, like one of them says, um, I don't know the answer to that, and she might, but I bet someone in this room does. How are you going to find out who that is? And sometimes teachers create displays. Um, a lot of teachers have sort of spontaneously created these ad hoc displays that sort of display the histories of kids who've gone through challenges so you can kind of find the expert in the room. Um, so that's the second thing. And then a third thing is making connections to 
more traditional disciplinary ideas. So these people are all teachers in either technology or science, typically. And so they're, as they get into Fuse over time, they're finding how to find an appropriate moment to connect what they've just managed to achieve with this set of wires in this little computer to a notion of a circuit that flows. And so it's sort of, but it, it inverts the normal sense of instruction. It doesn't say, here is this information, what do you do with it? It's more, you've just done something, let's look at the explanation for why it worked. And so those are, those are three things that um, we've found that good facilitators do over the years. And we've then tried to feed those back into our training so that, because it, it, it certainly is a, for some teachers, there's a loss of professional control. Like you're not in the front of the room, you're not, you, can't, you don't have everyone silent, they don't speak when you say, they don't stop speaking when you say. It is a different environment. It's a little bit more like being a librarian, actually, you know. Um, but most teachers who started, not all of them, but most people who started change, like the teacher in the video who said, I've learned a lot from my students. Um, almost all the teachers come to be very gratified, um, and I could share a lot of quotes with you, that they get to see kids have these moments. I mean, I think that's why anyone who's in education at any level, they want people to have those moments. And there's a lot of those moments in Fuse. And the more I see it, those teachers don't feel like they have to be the, the agents of that. They understand that they're more orchestrating the environment rather than controlling the environment. Is that a decent answer? Um, one more question and then... Um, I've got one if no one else yeah. has. There's one back there. Okay, yeah. Please. Um, have you thought about homeschooling? Oh. Whether doing this with homeschooling? Yeah, we have actually. Um, I've been approached a couple times. There's the. This is a good place to talk about why this ended up working better in schools than in um, community environments and libraries where we started. Um, the cohort effect of having, now this, there's an answer in related to homeschooling, but all the kids coming back over and over meant that as kids got interested in this or that, like Carmen, the 3D printer expert, she's there every day. In the libraries and in the community centers, you might be there, but that kid who has the expertise might not come this Saturday. And so we didn't have that sort of the cohort effect of kids all going through it together. So in a homeschooling context, where I would think it would be successful versus not successful, is if you have a group of families who are, are educating their kids in home together, um, and there's six, I don't know how many you'd want, but you'd, you'd want a, a small number that go through an experience together to simulate that peer culture. Um, if it were one-on-one, -on -one, I don't think it would be as successful. I think we're successful for cultural reasons, not because we've created materials that are so better than everything else. It's that culture that takes hold in the classrooms that becomes the kids' culture that makes it successful. I knew I promised that would let people go, but I have a question. Yeah. What, what design challenges are you wrestling with? Um, well, the questions of assessment are always encroaching. They're always sort of lurking at the door, um, meaning something like testing, something like assessment that, so that we can say that kids are learning something. I find that hard to understand in some ways because if a kid has just made something do something, haven't they just demonstrated that they can do that? But that somehow isn't enough. There needs to be some other, so that's me being skeptical, but schools have that so baked into their DNA that we're trying to wrestle with, um, and it's been a <coughs> multi-year wrestle. We're trying to think about how to do something that's non-intrusive, meaning doesn't disrupt their experience, and actually provides information, and isn't kind of parallel play with the actual work. Um, and I think we might have something that looks like a solution, finally, but that's the biggest one. Um, because 
uh, at some point in the conversation with superintendents or principals, they ask the question, how do you assess it? And um, a very big funder considered funding this and they, they decided to walk away because we didn't have an assessment system. I think we do have an assessment system, it's just informal. Um, but that's not a fully satisfactory answer. But I haven't been willing, like, I don't want that to kill the base experience. So that's, that's the biggest design challenge. Okay. I've been summoned by the hungry graduate students downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you.